Welcome to Speaking in Spoons with your host, Christina Brookman. Hi, this is Christina Brookman, your host with Speaking in Spoons, and the handsome uh, Dr. Strauss, your co-host. Whoa. And um, we are back with a personal story of disability. We have Eric here to share his journey with narcolepsy and multiple sclerosis. Hi, Eric. Hey, how's it going? Uh Good. (laughs) <laughs> it's good to, uh, it's so good to catch up and see you again. Um, thank you for being with us. Um, uh, when did you first, how long have you had narcolepsy and multiple sclerosis? Uh, well, MS is a really recent thing, um, past couple of years here, but narcolepsy I've had my entire life. It's just, we never knew what it was, you know, um, there were times, I mean, I just fall asleep, you know, or sleep weirdly at random times and stuff like that. Um, I, for a long time in class, I was always the kid that fell asleep in class. And nobody could figure it out. They just thought I was, you know, lazy or, you know, whatever. Right. Um, but uh, kind of, um, it wasn't, I guess, until later on. When I started having uh, more and more kind of, uh, I guess, episodes where I'd just fall asleep and fall asleep, um, or I'd start laughing and fall asleep. Um, and it wasn't until I fell asleep for a week straight, literally oh, wow. up to go to the bathroom, that it became to where I couldn't really function anymore. I can't work a nine to five or anything else, but... Along the way, somebody caught in one of my first couple sleep studies, because, I mean, back when I was a kid, they didn't know anything about it. You know, they they barely knew it existed. Um, I mean, they tried everything from like, you know, maybe he's anemic or, you know, uh, maybe he's on dope, you know, all kinds of I mean, crap. And, and uh, it would just always be the same. And uh, when somebody so you got caught, blamed a lot for it, like. Yeah, like accused of things. Yeah. Um, like especially um like for me, I mean, because narcolepsy is different for everybody that has it, just like every other thing. It's just that uh uh you know, it also kind of gets progresses, you know, as you get older. Okay. Um, as I've learned now. <laughs> Cause a lot of the stuff I've I've learned has only really been recent, mainly because um almost it, there's not a lot of uh, study about it um there's still a lot to figure out uh that and there's only a few different like medications that will and stuff but um just to say i mean on one end you know it, it's just been normal for me i i thought that everybody slept walked and talked to people in your underwear you know i i thought that uh you know I thought the things that I do when I sleep were just normal. I thought that was just how everybody slept. Did you, when, how long did it take you to, I guess, talk to it? Did your parents talk to doctors about it or? Oh, did... it wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't until my thirties. Wow. Yeah, to do a sleep study to see if I had sleep apnea so they can throw a machine on me and make some money. Uh, <laughs> and, um, Man. Uh, okay. <laughs> there was a thing back for a while in Toledo. No, I'm I'm in the same place, but they're all out to get you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sounding like my mom now. <laughs> I so identify with what you're saying, where you talk about it being your normal, like you not realizing that not everybody experienced. Because I, you know, you hear that phrase, um, women don't sweat. Well, I didn't sweat a lot growing up and as a woman and my mother didn't either and I'd heard that phrase so it never occurred to me to share that with my doctor 
um, because that might be information they might need to know because I just thought everybody, you know, all girl, this is just normal. Um, so did, did, so who was blaming you? Was that something that like, like teachers, uh, employers, parents, like, like but people were just assuming you're lazy and. Yeah. Or, or, um, the biggest thing I get a lot, um, when I try to describe, because I mean, I, this, it is hard to describe what, what narcolepsy really is like, because sure. I mean, the biggest one being, I thought it was normal, you know? Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Uh, um, it, it's a mix of things. And, um, I just happened to get the kind that gives you, um, it's called cataplexy. It's that thing that, 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 uh, you see in movies, you know, about people with narcolepsy, well, they're, they'll, you know, something will trigger them. And for me, it's yeah. laughter. If I laugh way too hard, um, I, I will fall asleep. And my, my friends make a, a game out of it and it's hilarious. Oh. No, seriously. It's like whoever can make Eric laugh till he goes to sleep is the winner, you know? So yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> there is some fun with it, you know, Yeah. yeah. because I fall asleep laughing my ass off and then wake up laughing my ass off. So, you know, it, it, it's just weird or, or like I have a conversation with somebody and go to sleep and return to that conversation two hours later and have no idea that I fell asleep you know, in the, mm. the on the couch talking to somebody. You know, oh wow. Like, it's kind of yeah. stuff like that. But um um yeah I, uh, because I mean yeah it's a sleep disorder but at the same time it's 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 like a uh uh epilep you know kind of thing you know because uh it does that. But, Were they able um, to find it in the first sleep study or did it take a couple of tests? It took a lot of them until I finally found the only narcolepsy specialist in Toledo. Uh, wow. then to, I have no, I, because they kept sending me to sleep specialist after sleep specialist. Uh, the first ones who caught it, I think I was, I want to say 32, I think, uh, when they first caught it. Um, and they asked me if I, you know, wanted amphetamines and I actually, you know, was still pretty big on recovery. You know, I'm like, no, uh, I'll just drink lots of coffee for now, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, you know, it's it's just been I've done everything I can kind of throughout the thing, the process, you know, here of avoiding having to get on things like Adderall or strain up, you know, all the other kinds of, of drugs. And the other drug, um was the only option I had until very recently um, is some stuff called uh, Zyrib, which is basically GHB. And it's the only drug that works uh, on uh, 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 cataplexy uh, until very recently. There's this new wow. stuff called Wakex and it works way better. I'm actually like awake and have a sleep schedule and like it's very strange. <laughs> I'm not like no, a I mean, whole I'm new world. Used to it. You know, like when my doctor, when I when I get asked the question by a doctor, uh, you know, how's your sleep? I'm like, yeah. what you know, I, I don't know what to tell them, you know. Did you sleep eight out? I'm like, I don't know. No, you know, I, sometimes I sleep five, so you know, it, it it's always kind of a random thing. Um, up until, I mean, quite seriously, the past, I want to say, like a couple of months getting on this new medication, it's been. You know, that must be refreshing, or is it? It's is both. it refreshing, or? It's refreshing and odd. I, 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 yeah, I don't know what it's like to be awake all day, you know, or not have to just close my eyes for 10, 15 minutes and, and get back up and do stuff, you know. And uh, one of the biggest difficulties has always been for me to, to find a job, you know, um, not for lack of trying. Right. Because, right. You know, I have, I have, in order to kind of legally, I guess, work and have somebody make accommodations for me, 
I have to say, you know, put a cot in the back, you know, <laughs> it's like, and can you, yeah, people can you, still know. Well, go ahead. Can you feel falling asleep coming on that you could get to the cot? Yeah, most of the time, yes. Okay. So it's not always like I'm laughing, laughing, fall asleep. So right, the, right. The it is hell, most of the time it's, it, it's, it, it'll start, I'll start getting real tired. You know, and um, okay, yeah. I, then I can basically go. Okay, I'm I'm moving here. Um, plus, I also let everybody know about it so they don't freak out. You know, um, I'm, yeah. like, I'm just asleep. You know, um, As a freak. Uh, I appreciated that about you because we we um um I dialect coached a play that he was in. And the first, that was one of the first things that he told me, but I always wondered, I thought it was just really incredible that you didn't let you, it stop you from doing something you're passionate about, like theater. And I was just kind of amazed at how it worked, um, just with the support, you know, just because, you know, I always think of safety and things like that with myself. Uh, to a point where sometimes people are like, you need to relax, Christina. Yeah. But I just, um, I love that spirit about you. How has, how were you able to do that? Like, how did that work being mm -hmm. on stage and working with other people when you might fall asleep like that? Oh, um, wow. Wow. Did you ever fall asleep during a performance? Oh, or? no, no. Um, no. Or driving. Or I've never fallen. There are times when just naturally you get a lot of adrenaline. Mm -hmm. uh, and that always keeps me oh. up. You okay. know, um, it's just like how I can, um, with with kind of what I'm dealing with, with, with my left side and stuff, I can, I, if I can kind of build up enough adrenaline, I can kind of power through things. Um, What's wrong with your left side? Is that the MS? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's what's going on with that. Um, I just I right now I'm getting off balance and trying to uh, learn how to use a cane. And, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Fun stuff. Um, so I get to be the old man with the cane now. <laughs> learn how to fight with it, and that way you can do like Yoda, like bust out a Yoda move when you're yeah. in trouble. <laughs> I've actually kind of gotten a bit nimble with it lately. I mean, uh, I've got a uh, you know guy down the hall who. He always moves backwards in his wheelchair and doesn't pay attention, but he's a nice guy. You know, he's my friend. So there's a lot of times I got to dodge him in his chair, you know. <laughs> uh, so sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm learning how to kind of get a little bit of my nimbleness back, you know. Okay. Um, so the other thing I'm figuring out is um, drumming. Uh, I can still drum, too. Uh, so that makes me real happy. <laughs> It's yeah, just that's cool. you know, since since I got sober and started kind of that journey in my life and then becoming, you know, a drug counselor and everything else like that. Mm. A lot of the times it was it, it, it's not necessarily about willpower. It, it, it was things like that. It, it's just I always play with the cards I'm dealt. I always look at what's right in front of me, you know, uh, and, and just try to kind of do the best I can with that. And, and I know that kind of no matter what happens it may be suck now um it will always get better or change in some way that will be better for a bunch of reasons um, yeah it's, it's yeah. just that you know i i personally can't allow myself to to give up on things you know that's you know like when i was forced to uh retire as i you know <laughs> Uh, uh to kind of quit working um you know uh i i didn't i didn't let that stop me you know at first i was real i, I didn't know what to do with myself for a bit there you know yeah. when you go from working like 12 hours a day or you know nine to five or, or whatever and you know at first it was like you know what am i what am i supposed to do now and then i just Went around and found shit I was already doing, you know, and it turned out that the stuff I was already doing, I was just happened to be in a great community for it. Uh, so I had just, you know, other ways of doing things. Um, 
like when I left uh, California as a kid, you know, I uh, had a choice of either moving to Texas with my family or continuing to pursue my my burgeoning film career. Uh, I chose uh, uh, and, and live in a cardboard box. So I chose to move to Texas and, and live in a house. Uh, but I always had, a, you know, like one of the things that I was always kind of taught and always kept is always have a couple of things to fall back on, you know. Um, so I always, I've always had a bunch of just really odd jobs where, you know, um, yeah, I have a profession, but then I have all these weird little hobbies and activities and things I've always done to keep myself occupied. Uh, so, you know, now uh, I can, I can, I've always been able to use those kind of things to my advantage. You know, if I can't, if there's not a job in a facility, you know, I can, I know I can work, uh, uh, I can, I can stand outside the bar uh, and breathe fire for tips, you know, uh, stuff like that. Uh, following, and, um, trying to find ways to just do shit I love no matter what. And even when I was working, I still made it a point to always do something that I love every week. So um, that's, I mean, kind of how I get through it. Um, that's what I, kept your spirit, like, to kind of survive through all of the stuff that has been thrown at you? Yeah. It's just focus on making sure you always doing something you love every day, even if it's as as possible, you know, I think a lot of people find them their identity through their work. And it's so hard when people like us with disabilities or you get sick, that's taken away. But that just sounds, it might, I, it's so smart of you to have all of these things that you, that can, you identify with that you can find a way to keep pulling in your your tool bag to kind of utilize at times like this um I think my first drug counselor told me yeah what i'm doing is building a toolbox <laughs> yeah yeah it's and a toolbox this is the first tool and you just keep finding and figuring out crap and putting it in your yeah. toolbox and when one tool doesn't work anymore you throw it out and get a new one i mean yeah it's that kind of concept. Um, I also was a Boy Scout growing up, you know, okay. uh, almost almost made Eagle Scout, but, you know. <laughs> but I mean, I, I kind of learned some stuff from that, you know. Um, and then where I grew up in, in you know, South Central in the 80s, you know, yeah. first things I, you know, you learn how to survive, you know. Um, so... In one way, I've had like a lot of just kind of interesting things happen, but um, you know that's yesterday, and, and I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And if I have one foot in yesterday and one foot in tomorrow, I'm pissing all over today. So you know, I know that I can I can take my kind of focus of, of right now from what's directly in front of me to then widening it out, if that makes sense. You know, yeah. It's just, you, you learn little kind of tools, you know, kind of as you go along. Um, yeah. And uh, I just take any opportunity to share them little tools when I can. Thank you. You're I, welcome. You're welcome. Um, what do you, what's the best advice you think anybody gave to you, I guess, other than the, the this toolbox? concept in your journey it was a lot of it is has to do with my grandfather and how he helped raise me um a lot of tools i learned from like i said boy scouts and, and just and growing up um it's always like little things that'll help you out you know it's always something small mm. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's I mean it's hard enough to describe to people, kind of what what goes on. Like for instance, like you know, I, this is a new place for me. You know, I'm in a new city and everything else. And when because of where I grew up, if somebody knocks on my door, really, you know, starts pounding on my door, um, the first thought that goes through my head is, okay, somebody's trying to break in. You know, 
or you know but um if i'm suddenly awoken i can still be dreaming while i'm moving around trying to figure something out so for instance uh -huh. if bang is on my door like has happened uh immediately i go from i'm having a dream about fighting with somebody to i'm fighting with somebody there's the front door and then opening up the front door until I finally realized, oh crap, I'm in my house. There's that person in front of me. And then I orient myself. You know, uh, they've, they've come to understand and, and learn, learn that one because they know I don't like to raise my voice at all. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you are a very peaceful I, person. Oh, I do um, like that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Can you... Uh describe to the followers what it's been like to to have a disability a condition and then now be going through the the process of diagnosis and adjustment acclimatization acclimat I can't speak today <laughs> um adjusting to a whole other disability of multiple sclerosis well it's kind of a uh throwing stuff at the wall to figure out what works, really. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I know that no matter what else happens, I will always have my mind and my personality. You know? Um, and luckily, because of the pandemic, this is like the best thing to come out of the whole thing um, is, is my new job where I get to utilize every skill I have and can do it straight from a chair if I need to. You mm -hmm. know? And um, it's been great uh, because it's something I've been doing my whole life, acting and role-playing games. Can you tell <laughs> them um, specifically what you're doing? Because you were telling us earlier that you were so excited. <laughs> was, yeah. Oh, man. All right. So <laughs> since I was six years old, I've been playing Dungeons and, Dungeons and Dragons, okay? And I'm about to turn 50 this year um and have played ever since um because it, it 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 allowed me to be creative uh while i was still kind of really shy around mm -hmm. other people you know uh, yeah. and and the thing is is that over the years it's just it's one of those things that i love to do that kind of i can transfer a lot of different skills with you know I've always worked in a game store or I uh, had a weekend, uh, you know, 40K game going on or just, you know, I've always been a part of that little community. And um, then the pandemic hit and suddenly, um, you know, people that like I was doing like theater jobs and some other stuff at the time. And then that went out the window overnight, you know, <laughs> and, and all that kind of happened. And literally out of nowhere, I mean, the whole board game industry i mean it blew up like like nobody none of us could ever believe that it's something we've always wanted uh you know but the cool thing is that now i i work for myself at a place called start playing games start playing dot games um where i run role-playing games for people uh i charge you know however many bucks you know ahead and I can kind of do what I want, and I'm doing everything that I love all in one place. So I don't have to go to the game store anymore. You know, I, if I can't have people over, I know that I can, uh, you know, hop online and play a game of 40K with somebody over the internet. You know, um, and there's there are is a lot more opportunity for people with disabilities to to be able to to do a lot more now because a lot more of what we do is being shifted online you know people kind of come and play one of my games kind of like they would go to a movie every week you know what i mean it's i charge about the same price as you would to to, to go see a movie in the movie theater you know um, it's just, it, there's a lot of different ways to kind of uh, use the internet to, to um, kind of, as a job, you know, just getting a little bit creative. And the other thing is that I teach classes now on this kind of stuff. You know, I, I tell yeah. other GMs how to roll, how to, you know, 
how to build a story, how to, you know, keep players engaged, how to not be a douchebag, you know? <laughs> I think this is incredible, my... though. What yeah. were you going to say, Nate? Sorry. This guy's got to talk to one of my old DMs. He, was, he could use some education. <laughs> well, you know. Just think, you... And you were saying, too, like our generation, too. Like, this is just something that I think a lot of people would identify um, with that could give people and it's about like you said getting creative about what how can I take the tools in my bag and apply it to something online like that's kind of what Nate and I are doing with the podcast here like it's you know it's limited right now I have no idea how much I'll be able to do but it's trying to still stay somewhat active in a way and use my mind our you know our minds as much as possible and and help people um but uh I just I didn't even think about gaming like that like uh that's yeah. just so so it's like incredibly this. I, cool. I have gotten so many different actors into gaming yeah I start when I'm not doing theater right yeah. uh, I keep my acting chops up from doing role-playing games and yeah specifically vampire the masquerade and you know i've been running that since day one when i pulled it out of the box at the game store i worked at in high school so now it's like that's like my bread and butter now um <laughs> so yeah anything i i i'm a horror gm i i you know that's what i do uh and i have a lot of fun doing it um and um for the most part, like the gaming community as a whole has always been kind of full of introverts, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, kind of. Talking about extroverted all the way. Or... Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you're even like remotely extroverted in a game store, it it freaks people out. You know, yeah. it's like suddenly everybody's up against the wall going, hey, look at that guy, you know? But that's always me. So I'm used to it. And I tell them, get out, you know, get away from the wall, come here and play a game, you douchebag. So. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean, it, like I said, it it, it it it's something that I can apply the things I love all together. You know, whether it's you know, sure, I can't act on stage anymore. That's just not going to be possible. But I can still direct. I I you know I can still you know t teach other people stuff. You know, I may be entering that phase in life where where it's it's you know, uh, those who can do and those who can't teach, you know, um, which <laughs> that's kind of like how I kind of feel right now is that yeah I'm I'm running I'm not really necessarily running games because I get I, I'm actually starting to get back the money I put into it if that makes sense like okay I bought everybody snacks this week sweet. <laughs> gave me a dollar sweet you know so <laughs> it's kind of like everybody pitching in for snacks i mean uh, you know but um yeah uh i encourage anybody to to kind of go out and give it a shot because um even if you are shy introverted you're not feeling really comfortable about yourself putting things about yourself into an elf with the sword you know is great freaking therapy you know, um, and it helps you kind of, I, it's it, one of the coolest things I've always loved about running games is, is watching an introverted person suddenly kind of come out of their shell, you know, and, and that, that is always is what brings me the most kind of joy I, I, about like running these games for people. Like I do, uh, LARPs, which is, you know, we don't like beat each other with like boffer weapons and bullshit. We actually like act our shit out. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's just how I keep things up, you know, um, find a few good things that you're interested in and don't be afraid to try something new. I mean, yeah. I think it's great advice. Um, uh, I know, um, you had, uh, we talked about recently had a struggle with housing, um, instability, which is. I think yeah, a lot of people yeah. when they're sick or going through disability uh, can identify with that. 
Um, is that something you could speak to your experience? Well, so far my experience is that I've, well, I got kind of lucky in a roundabout way because uh, I, 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 I was a drug counselor. So I knew what community resources I needed when I needed them. Um, but now that I've kind of put myself in a better place and, you know, I've always made enough for like basic housing, you know, I've, I just, as a person, I've, I've never really liked or, you know, trying to live above my means, you know, I've just always been that way. I have like a credit, I have a credit score of like zero because <laughs> if I don't have money, I don't, I don't, you know, I try not to fucking buy it, you know, Right. Uh, it's hard, but you know, you do your best. Um, so, you know, as long as I know that I can have, you know, my basics, everything else is just icing on the cake. You know, I have a place to sleep. I got food in my belly. I got some clothes on, at least for now. I'm good. You know, everything else is extra. You know, that's just kind of how I look at it. But this area of Illinois, or Illinois as a whole, has a lot. What like when I was uh, doing like counseling because you you got to do community a lot of community stuff when you're doing that, uh, you know, pulling up resources for people to use. Um, I had the there I would have to hunt things down in Ohio. You know, uh, there's not a whole lot, and and here I have the exact opposite problem in Illinois where I don't know which one of these 25 freaking places to go to, you know, so. It's amazing like, how different it is state to state with resources. Um, it really is. It is a huge difference between like, uh, I mean, that's like a state away, you know? Yeah. And, and it's, it's really, uh, yeah, it, it it does really depend on where you live. It really does. And that I it really wasn't until I got here that I really kind of understood it because I knew kind of what levers to pull, you know. Right. So I'm like, where's this, 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 and this? And and you know, um, so yeah. The I mean, I've part, even started stuff, looking at oh, I'm sorry. I was at the um, hard stuff for me has been trying to uh, make my my place wheelchair accessible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm having to Tetris stuff, you know, because I have like the same games, like board games I've had forever, you know, and and it's it's, yeah. <laughs> it's hard. No, I had I'm I'm supposed to use a rollator in the house for safety in case. I go paralyzed from my condition and then and need to sit immediately, right. but I can't because of where things are in the house. So I have to use my cane and then just kind of lean up again, like use furniture and things around as railing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think about, and I, sometimes I have a wheelchair too. Like I use a wheelchair when I leave the house, but when we go places, Oftentimes, you know, my boyfriend or my caretaker will be wheeling and we can't get the chair into a door in like a public facility. And I think of, I'm like, well, at least, God forbid, I could get up with my cane that I had and like walk through the the door and they could fold up the chair and move it. And then we, yeah. you know, if we had to, but I think of people that do not have that capability. Um and just the fight to have things accommodating um, and accommodating in your own home. Yeah. That's, um, huh. that's also, I guess, a really strange thing about narcolepsy. Yeah, it's not obvious. Right. You can't look at somebody and say, hey, that guy's got narcolepsy. No, you just see him suddenly fall asleep to the table. And then, yeah. you know, an hour later, he's still at that table, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, yeah, it's... it's An invisible kind of disability. Yeah, and, and I can't drive anymore, you know? They won't let me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, there. yeah, for multiple reasons now, not just the yeah. <laughs> Before it was, if you take your medicine, you can drive. And now it's, we don't want you touching a car ever. Don't even go near one. <laughs> but a loss of freedom, I guess, in a way. It well, is, yeah. It is. Uh, which is why I'm glad the internet exists the way it does now. Right. Otherwise, it opens up that freedom again. In virtual. Yeah, it does. I mean, yes, it is not as good as being able to give somebody a hug right after you talk to them. You know, but it's close enough, damn it. <laughs> and it's better than not seeing their face at all. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Are advantages for internet friends over like local friends? Like it's just because the internet lets you have friends everywhere. Mm -hmm. awesome. You can have friends in other countries. You can have friends like in other time zones. It's just, mm -hmm. I, I think that's one of the pluses of not being able to physically go out. Yeah, and uh, I, in this place, I've I've already made quite a few really like really good friends there's some really good people here some of the best people i've actually met you know in my life and um it's made it a lot that has made it a lot easier to to figure things out and, and kind of cope and and um i think that has been the biggest help for me right now has been having a friend circle not just that but For a while, I was really embarrassed by, like, my facial weird stuff it does, you know, or, um, you yeah. know, I didn't want anybody to see it, you know. Um, so it's taken me a while to get just used to the concept, you know, of, okay, you know, now I have this physical thing, you know, but now I'm around a bunch of other people that have the same physical thing. And yeah. Talk about it, and yeah, it's 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 that's been really really helpful. If I didn't have somebody else to talk to, uh, that was also disabled who's been through it, you know, that's been the most. I mean, better than any doctor here, you know. Uh, overall, I always learned that. Um, I guess. In a selfish way, helping others helps me. I know that no matter what happens in a small way, if I do something to help somebody else, at least, you know, a little bit a day, you know, uh, it, it's, it's an accomplishment and it'll be remembered. And not just that, but it makes me feel good to be helpful. Yeah. So, you know, it's not a big ass deal to, to, to pick something up for somebody and say hi, you know, or, or, you know, um, like I said, it's always those little things. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's just always been that way for me. And a lot of it for me has to do with recovery, learning those lessons that I did for several I mean, years of being decades now of being sober, you know. Um, building that toolbox, that, that's like my, my biggest damn thing I can think of that is that gets that got me through it. Yeah. Um. Sorry, you just you got to me when you started talking about having the people around that that got it. Um, because um, you know, and then I think Nate, you're you're one of those people for me. Um, because sometimes we just talk to each other every day. We'll go through our droughts, but recently we've been doing that. I've been kind of in a rough patch and he'll call me every day to check on me and even if I don't answer he'll call me the next day and check on me just keep pursuing um and yeah we do that offended. from our people huh <laughs> I'm not offended plus I don't have yeah you know, I I don't know I like checking up on you yeah it makes me feel good I like checking up on you and well, I think we need and it's those little things huh well, when you talk about your problems, it gives me like a brief, like moments of not thinking about my problems. <laughs> so I was just like, yeah. oh, he's got problems. Yeah, okay. Don't worry about my <laughs> yeah. 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 
It's like, you know, hey, how's your chair? It sucks today. How's your cane? Fuck it. <laughs> what are you doing today? Eat and totally. put it. Let's go. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> But you like you get to vent and you get to encourage each other too. Like you always yeah, have yeah. to I mean, just you, still encourage, yeah. You know, the the curtain doesn't come down until the show's over. Like like mm -hmm. it, every day you get up and you're breathing, that's another day. Like just don't give up. Never What's surrender. Never surrender. surrender. <laughs> I know that my a lot of times my people i guess that I would consider like somebody an enemy you know i i know that my just me existing is going to bother them uh, so it gives me just a little bit of, of guilty pleasure just <laughs> hey, I, this, like being you know, alive hi guys yeah. where it's like i'm living rent free in their head yeah <laughs> you you're you're living off the government like it's just like just waking up and knowing that i feel like gives me some sauce Mitch, Mitch McConnell's having like a heart attack because I like get Medicaid. Oh, God. Oh, <laughs> man. Yeah. It's like that's, oh, a, that's an episode for I'm, another day. I, I, yeah. I, I haven't been paying into but this. But hey, if it keeps you life. living each day. Wow. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because well, I mean, I got a Coke today and it felt nice. <laughs> An extra like a classic, like a classic Coke or one of the newfangled, wow. one of whatever's whatever's out of the machine, man. Okay. <laughs> uh, I got an extra dollar. You, I'm getting the Coke. <laughs> I've heard if you get Coke from Mexico, it's like extra nice. I don't. I'm not. Oh, sure. but yes, no, because it's no. the original. Yeah, it's well, the not original. just that, but yeah, they're not exporting Mexican Coke. All right, like you have Mex. There's a big difference. Um, it has Coke. Just well, the rest. I don't think Coca Cola has no. Coke it, it, they not anymore. The, they use the, the the leaf that the Coke was from to flavor it. So, but I mean, it doesn't have cocaine. But um, cocaine. I, growing up in Southern California, and then especially high school in San Diego, I go to Mexico all the time. You know, um, it's not that you know, far away, you can just walk over the border or even take a taxi, you know, and, and just go into Mexico. Um, but one of the cool things and what a lot of people do in Mexico is find, go around finding glass bottles because you could take those back to the uh, factory, which the Corona factory was right there and the Coke factory was right there. And basically they'll refill them. So everybody from like California kept their bottles and we, you know, go on big trips down to Mexico to the bottling factories, get a bunch of Corona and a bunch, you know, dirt cheap. Uh, Corona? Yeah. But no, I mean, like Here. Mexico, <laughs> Mexican Coke. There's, right. a, there's a Corona factory? Yes. She's thinking no, of the... Thinking of the virus. No, Corona, the alcoholic beverage. Oh, crap. I forgot. No, yeah, the beer. The beer. Yeah, you forgot you throw a lime on top. No, not get the beer. Fire get the corona. <laughs> wow. Well, I just thought about that. That co that company's got to be fucked right. Oh, you know, screwed right now. Oh yeah, yeah. The corona. Yeah, I I thought about. <laughs> Kick back about and have a corona. No, no, oh. I don't think I will. <laughs> well, or if you oh, catch, it's you catch corona. Drink a Corona while having Corona. There's like a there's like a like a symmetry with that. <laughs> I would make, yeah, that'd be a good <laughs> have Corona. Got corona, like I'm shit. A corona. There's Not your ad anymore. You're welcome. You're welcome, Corona. There's your ad campaign. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, it's been so good having you today, Eric. Um, <laughs> thank you for coming on and you're sharing welcome. your story. Um. And uh, we'll have to have you again. Yeah, no um, problem. And then point people, you know, over to start playing dot games, and they can look me up. And oh, yeah. Yeah. there's, I'm not saying like plug in my crap, but I mean just, just in general for like I said, anybody, uh, even just to 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 have something to do on a weekend, you know, hop on over there. There's a ton of people just playing games, man. We can put it on our website, actually. That way they can see it and see what you're all about and 
you know, learn for themselves. I think that would be cool. Yeah, and um, then if, uh, even if, uh, uh, you know, also I have like a back channel full of GMs that I, you know, thousands of them from all oh, wow. of them, you know, so, so if I can't, if I can't accommodate somebody's game, there are tons of people who can. So, awesome. you know, yes. Thank you. You're Did welcome. you have any final questions, Nathan? Did I? Uh, yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know if you've noticed this about MS, that, that your diet does play a role. Like your diet, your lifestyle plays a role. And I think me personally, my, my lifestyle and diet choice are my own, but I don't know if it, it's helpful to you or to tell the audience that, that you found that how like tweaking those things does help make your life a little easier or, or maybe you haven't found that with it. Um, well, I've actually, um, I've been changing my diet, honestly. You know, you know the difference? Yeah, well, yeah. Um, besides, you know, certain medications. Um, I, I've, there's, there's been a noticeable difference, you know. Um, plus, I, I, I exercise. Like I said, I play drums. So, I mean, my doctor wants to do more cardio. You know, and I'm like, yeah, right now it's my left side, but I know that just kind of, I, I always figure crap out some way, you know, yeah. I'll bang my head against something until, you know, it, basically either it works or I'll, I'll finally give up. But, okay. uh, um, being able to, to, to keep these muscles, you know, good. Also, uh, you know, for my coordination and things like that, you know, I know that if I keep drumming, that if I, you know, um, and painting miniatures, that that I it's, things will start seem to kind of compensate, just like I do for narcolepsy. You know, it's like telling all my friends this. You know, hey, I can't hold the paintbrush this way, so I got to hold it this way now, or I got to hold it this way now, or it's like, well, now shit, I can't do that. So we're going to go over here, you know, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I've sent, I, I've actually taken the, the um, advice of, of actually listening to my doctor for once. Uh, so that's made a lot more uh, helpful. <laughs> Eric, hey. sit down. No, Eric, sit down. No. <laughs> I want to. Um, well, thank you, Eric. And we look forward to talking to you again. And um, uh, listeners, followers, um, stay tuned for an after party where Nate and I will all up from the episode. Thank you very much. Hey, welcome back. This is Christina, your host for Speaking in Spoons with the handsome Nate Strauss or Dr. Nate Strauss. And um, we are doing our after party uh, for uh, Eric, uh, who you just listened to talk about his personal story of disability with um, narcolepsy and multiple sclerosis. Um, I know uh, we had a lot of fun talking with him um what are your thoughts Nate well I'm excited because he's found this sort of career as a GM and I want to try to incorporate that into the show because it's something we could do online but as, as far as like what he's dealing with I think one of the commonalities we have with our illnesses is that it's unpredictable like you just yeah keeps you from holding down a job, keeps you from, you know, thinking, you know, we all have these ideas of what we want to do. And then the disease comes in and we have to re, we have to pivot. Yeah. So I think, think that's a good word for it. Like you're constantly pivoting. Every time you think you've got your grasp, you know, the disability universe throws you something else and we just have to get really good at pivoting and just going, okay, this is what it is now. How can I, what can I do with my life now? And, and also, you know, he has two disabilities and so many people out there 
do have like it's not just the one you're when you have one well, you're gonna have yeah. multiple things that pop up <laughs> multiple symptoms yeah well that's i just i think that's more due to our medical schematics like that these illnesses aren't isolated to one area and then when they bleed over to another area you get another name for it but it's really all the same thing you inflammation know? Yeah, it's a lot of it's inflammation. A lot of it's like with the lymphatic and cardiovascular system and nervous system. It's like, yeah. it's all part of the same thing. Like, I just like, I don't, I don't know. I feel like cancer is a good example, like, because cancer can metastasize to another area of the body, but you're, it's yeah. still, you're still, it's still the same thing. It's just moved like somewhere else. I just, it's still I mean, cancer. Yeah. I feel like it's a better example than, other like this with Eric with his like narcolepsy plus his MS like those you would think would be very different illnesses but I think they share a lot of commonality because they're both disruptions of the autonomic nervous yeah. system yeah exactly I also thought it was really interesting um what he spoke to about growing up and just not really talking to his doctors about um, things that are quote unquote wrong with him or different about him because he never it was always his normal so he didn't realize it was something he needed to like report technically and he would constantly get in trouble for it and have people be like oh that's you know you're you know selective when you want to fall asleep all this stuff but it's like no this is something he's legit experiencing and then it doesn't get diagnosed to later in life and I um I identify with that so much because um I can't remember if I mentioned that to him about like because you know that saying you know girls don't sweat women don't sweat so I just so many of my symptoms right. it was just my normal and my mom experienced a lot of the same things too not just the lack of sweating like overheating digestive issues like I just thought and it wasn't really till I got married that, you know, my husband started being like, um, that's not normal, Christina. And I was like, why not? Everybody does this. And he's like, no. Um, right. And I was like, oh, maybe I should tell my doctor. Um, and it still just felt weird to do that. Um, like, I think a lot of people that know me now think that I'm somebody that's just always like been comfortable going to the doctor I share everything with the doctor I trust everything the doctor says that is absolutely not true at all like I spent my whole childhood being encouraged not go to the doctor by one parent and to go to the doctor by the other and it just made it very complex and confusing for me and so I was just anti-medical period um until stuff just kept falling apart and it for like basically when I shredded my hip um, labrum. We still don't know why. And my back went out. Like, um, that's when things, well, I mean, all through college, I had stuff happen too, now that I think about it. Yeah, it's yeah. weird. No, I, I totally mean, went on a tangent, but my point was I get the whole not sharing things with doctors because you don't realize it's something you need to share. Um, and or I don't know don't how know. we solve yeah. it. Yeah, huh? you don't know, or you're ashamed of it, or you don't like feel yeah. like it's just needed information. Yeah, you, know? and just, you like, don't you want to overload them with stuff, like. Yeah, well, I don't think I shared a lot of the issues I was having. Like these issues started in middle school. Like my yeah. illness, like I had trouble, like with like neurological stuff, starting back in middle school and high school, and people called me lazy. And yep. I just was like, well, I guess I'm lazy, you know, like I didn't think about it even. And it's even through college, I was tired a lot. I never like yeah. I would push through it. I would push through it. But it was always like I get like, you know, brain fog and stuff. And I just, you know, you think everyone's dealing with it. Yeah. And it's just not true. I was antisocial because as soon as work or school was over, I was home because I couldn't. I couldn't stay up and do it like I can handle it. I, and there were other reasons too, but for the most part it was because I was in pain and I was exhausted. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and it's sad that people 
teased him too for falling asleep and yeah they tease you because you're yeah you, they're not they don't deal with it so it's just yeah. like you're being lazy or sleepy and it's just yeah. something it's something you're intentionally doing and i think yeah. that that gets a lot of that and you get a lot of guilt too because you feel like am i intentionally doing this maybe it's me yeah. yeah. Maybe Can I'm you just imagine being... if, if an adult had just stepped in and go, I see this kid sleeping a lot at random times. Maybe there's right. something going on, you know? Is that a problem with the system though, that no one really looks at other people like having issues? Like I know I notice stuff about other people now, but I don't think I ever would have Yeah. Glanced at it if I hadn't been dealing with that myself. Yourself? Yeah. When I I started noticing things earlier because I was dealing with my mom and I know you were dealing with your dad, but that also raises its own complexities um, because my mom was called a hypochondriac most of my childhood. So I was raised to believe by medical people from family that she was a hypochondriac and just making stuff up and, you know, attention seeking. And, and so it just gave me a very complicated relationship with like medical stuff you yeah know? I think we both do I mean because yeah. I think most people walk around with what they're glad to have medical care if they need it but we're like in it like a lot of people yeah. like us we're just we're, we're leaning on it and we're finding it wanting in a lot of ways like it's yeah. good in some ways but it's lacking in other ways yeah and well, I, think, I think we notice it more, like you said, because we're there. Like, I like to say I have my frequent flyer card. Yeah. <laughs> and I think but. Eric's the same way. Like, I think you needed the system, but it kind of, I don't know if it, like, it failed you in a lot of ways, but it just seems like it sometimes. Yeah. Like, it's, it's not intentional or malicious. It just no. falls through the cracks. Well, and, and I think a lot of kids fall through the cracks people fall through the cracks in general and like you know teachers are mandated reporters and all these things and I've been a teacher but it's you people forget how many things they've got going on in their head during the day and how many kids they're observing and all of this stuff and um you know and the parents are working and they're doing all these things it's like how do we create a system where people can stop and breathe and and notice something that's happening on a child because if we notice something that's happening in a child just think of how much intervention and help physically emotionally everything that can be done and a lot of these things do start when we are younger and they progress you know yeah um and it, like it's not just you know there but think of the people like when you bring up cancer like how um how do we get to a society where it's more preventative and it's more where you feel comfortable talking to your doctor where you know what questions to ask your doctor your doctor's asking you questions that are helping you lead to stuff too you know i don't know it's just our i mean i don't want to reference another person we talked to but the incentives are all out of whack like i think the incentives to prevent over diagnose are inadequate. And I think the system itself is too many influences who are there for the wrong reasons. A lot of what, what do you call bad players? Like, I think there are a lot of people in the mix that are making it harder for us to get to that sort of utopian medical system that, you know, like the, the world without disease. How cool would it be if that was something that was taught in school? like self-advocacy and like you know like we we this has been on my mind a lot lately in regards to um the idea of and this is kind of off topic but the idea of like um consent and things like that um and that's something that really needs to start being taught at a much younger age and we have an amazing program in virginia called hugs and kisses that actually tour schools and teaches good touch bad touch you know and and talks about like a trusted adult but there aren't necessarily programs like that nationwide but there's also i think needs to be deeper conversations of consent but also if you take 
that and then look at the conversations you could be talking about what is my body what is quote unquote normal what is healthy how do i feel comfortable talking to somebody when i notice something how do i stand up for things to protect myself like in in all of these situations or advocate like those are life skills you know and yeah would be no, great a lot, at any... it, a lot of it's flying blind like i think yeah. we don't know like it's weird that both you and i thought the problems we had were normal but we grow <laughs> up and we're like we were just <laughs> completely abnormal with all the things that were happening and if you caught that when we were younger maybe we could have done something more about it yeah yeah and a lot, like John said, you know, the importance of early intervention and stuff for a lot of this. Stuff. But I didn't get diagnosed until after college. Yeah, same. But I was having symptoms in middle school. Same. And it's just like. And, and like was, Eric, like, yeah, people make me want to call him lazy. Yeah. Where was the person? Yeah, this is like, and you, you have no idea because you're just a kid having yeah. issues and you're like, everyone's probably having these issues but then it come you come to realize that nobody was having those issues yep and you're taught that you're lazy or you're taught that you're you know and it's i don't know if we're taught or, it, but we get that sense of that it. well you get that well, some people get that and you get that sense you get that guilt um yeah you get like people will blame guilt. other things um when it's not and and it's really about listening. That's the, I think the other thing it goes down to people, kids, adults learning how to advocate for themselves. And then also truly listening to people when they're telling you what's going on with them and not deciding what it is for them, you That's know, it. listen yeah. to their full experience, take note of all of it, because otherwise you're, you're missing out on what it could be. If you're there, it's, you know, it's just like with, you know, a detective case or something. If they do like the the narrow focus, you're going to miss. Well, I mean, you see that good. kind of, it's just, it's funny because you see that in TV shows, you know, like Grey's Anatomy or House where the patient yeah. comes in, they got this like crazy thing that other doctors are like, I know how to fix And it's just, but then the doctor comes in, this special doctor, but it turns it like it, it the reality is that the, those doctors, they probably don't exist really. They like don't. they're even more rare than zebras like they're <laughs> just like you never see a house come in and say oh you're pro like it's just like this people don't exist so i think that's probably why we went so long without anyone yeah. you know raising an eyebrow talk more about the the gm thing that you want to do because i love your idea oh uh, yeah what you i think do. speaking I think in cool. spoons is going um Dungeons and Dragons. Like I think we need to start We're going full nerd with, with Eric, who is a GM, and I think that like he had this idea of us being vampires, which is something I've never done with Dungeons and Dragons before. So I think that's be pretty cool. So stay tuned for Christina and I, hopefully in the near future, um, becoming you know the children of the dark. You know. And, uh, I already am with my like fully darkened room, um. But yeah, so this I'm excited about this. We're uh, uh, you had the great idea to call it D cubed, and um, because we're disability dungeon and dragons, and it I think it's a great way uh to socialize and a great way to explore this medium over the internet. You know. Does that? Yeah. That's totally the wrong whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm excited. Vampires. So stay tuned and uh, save your spoons. If you want to contact us, please send a DM or email to speakinginspoons at gmail.com with any stories you have or would like to interview with us on any of our upcoming topics. And check out our website for all of our upcoming episodes and what's happening in the Speaking in Spoons community at www.speakinginspoons.com. Thank you for listening to Speaking in Spoons, and have a great day.